So uh, we hope to have all the registered people in a while. Um, in the meanwhile, let me begin with introductions. I welcome all of you for the first day of uh, this symposium on ancient roots to modern science, rejuvenating vernacular architectural technology for contemporary relevance. It's a one-day session that we are holding uh, on understanding the relevance of all kinds of scientific principles and technological innovations that we are seeing not in mainstream but in vernacular Indian practices. The idea was to understand and explore how these practices uh, can be modeled scientifically, part one. And secondly, after they have been modeled, can we look at their application for contemporary practices? We realized after uh, doing the work, which we haven't really been doing for long, it's just been about six, seven months, we realized this is a kind of field which cannot uh, be, uh, be uh, or involved with only one discipline. This involves many disciplines to come together. This is not the job of just an engineer who will be able to model, but this also cannot be uh, the problem associated with, with only the historical understanding of what these structures imply. And therefore, we thought that it was important that this symposium is an interdisciplinary symposium. And with that in view, we've tried our best to have a panel which uh, uh, spans quite a few disciplines. We have today archaeologists, we have engineers, architects, historians. In fact, we even have a Sanskrit scholar. And we hope that uh, the kind of discussions and deliberations that they hold today would generate a dialogue which would bring in a very holistic perspective to this field. Uh, with this, I would also like uh, to thank some people with, and associations with whom we have been able to work for the last six, seven months. Uh, Mrs. Sharma is here, and I must take this opportunity to thank Ministry of Human Resources and Development for having supported Sandhi. In fact, it is through her initiative that Sandhi has got launched in many IITs successfully. And this particular symposium, which is a part of IIT Kanpur Sandhi, uh, belongs to the Museum Project, again funded by MTRI, and we are very thankful for their support for this particular initiative. Um, and we are also very thankful to Professor Mana, our director, who has supported this initiative in IIT Kanpur and has been along with us uh, throughout. Uh, on a Saturday also, he's here for the symposium, despite his uh, engagements. Besides that, we have uh, all our, in fact, many of our Sunday representatives are here. Professor Anurag Gupta is here. He's actually the project investigator. Uh, I think uh, Professor Bhat Lohani is here. He's also a part of our uh, Sandhi group, and others may follow in soon. So with this, I would like to uh, begin the symposium. And uh, with this introduction, I would like to invite uh, Mrs. Sharma to give the inaugural address for uh, the symposium. Mrs. Sharma, as I mentioned, was uh, is, is, is an IS officer and uh, has been working very closely with Sandhi. In fact, Sandhi is her brainchild. It's not even our brainchild. Uh, she initiated it during the last two years, uh, and it is through her concepts and uh, and ideas that this entire symposium and also the whole idea of Sandhi Sandhi has generated. I would like her to uh, speak about the genesis of Sandhi as well as what vernacular architecture would mean in the construction of this museum in IIT Kanpur later. I'm very keen on hearing you rather than in saying anything to you. It seems to me very ironic and paradoxical that I should be giving an inaugural address. I think a lot of people confuse the fact that because you're an additional secretary in charge of IITs, you must be some sort of a scholar. Well, let me completely uh, uh, you know, sort of dispel any such illusions. But I er, am er, uh, happy to be here and would use this for five minutes, 10 minutes maybe to uh, share with you some other, other perspectives uh, which are actually not really ministerial perspectives. That would be a wrong way. I don't think ministry dictate agendas to IITs. So, Comedy. I don't think I can have a brainchild that the IITs will sort of happily lap on to yeah, the other way around. I think a lot of the potential here gets articulated when there is a support from the government or from uh, an agency that has the capacity for scaling things up, for foregrounding certain uh, issues. But uh, uh, more uh, fundamentally, <coughs> Sandhi uh, <coughs> really is, uh, in, is, is uh, 
Sandy, really, everybody is language. That's what occurred to me. I came into Sandy early on to my life because I spent a long time of my life working with children in very remote tribal areas uh, and uh, working as an officer for their educational purposes. So I met very, very dispersed and diverse societies and was immersed in their life and their habitats and was trying to figure things out with them. So much of my uh, alternative discourses and my awareness of the essential unity of experience came from having worked with a uh, very uh, society very different from the one that I was actually uh, part of. And uh, so, uh, and then all the, th all the stuff that I had read, you know, more formal philosophies and uh, cl uh, sort of tough texts when you're a graduate student, you read all the stuff stuff that's difficult to master. A lot of that started making sense to me because I was living with people and trying to see things from, turn the metaphysic of the world around from their perspectives. And the whole ontological and epistemological anchoring of what Sandhi actually is now grew from that experience. And that's what I thought I would share with you. But before I get into that, there are two things I want to say. This is my, my uh, way of coming to Sandhi. But when we were recently in Dr. Manna, well, there are testimony to that, how when the Prime Minister, Mr. Narain Modi, was there with the directors of the IITs and their chairpersons, just recently, in the month of August, I think, he, he was also a Sandhi person, because he listened to all these presentations, and he, of course, comes from a vast knowledge and experience of even more diverse contexts than I do. And he listened, and he's aware, and he said that, uh, he came up with these two, three questions, and I want to take the opportunity of posing them to you so that we arrive at what exactly something means. He said, uh, why do we not have indigenous technologies to, uh, for our own needs, and why are we so heavily dependent on uh, importing uh, our knowledge and our technologies, and uh, why do we not have that? Have we lost our own capabilities? Are we ignorant of our own inherent strength? And he gave small little uh, challenges like why are we not able to do have our own paper for minting per, you know for the uh, currency etc but the point he was trying to make one was why are we so ignorant of our own capabilities why can we not develop them the second point he raised was, was very interesting he said why are we not able to look around at the creativity and innovation of the communities around us who actually are far more ingenious because they're not even formally literate where they are surviving and their methods of survival and sustainably surviving is profoundly, or, you know, is profound knowledge actually. And why are we not able to look at that? The point he was raising actually was why are we obsessed because we are a higher education institute, so why is in India particularly, why is higher education confused with the dichotomy between high end and low end? So if you talk about, I was telling Professor Ashutosh Sharma right now, that for nanotechnologies, we will think, oh, this is high-end, advanced materials, high-end, computer science, ICD, high-end. But if you look at the artisan's tools, we'll say, oh, that's low-end, and that's frugal technology. These are only descriptive epithets, maybe because you're investing less money in them, and they require less research infrastructure at some point. But are we then looking at the value of knowledge from the point of view of, the, of a cost-benefit analysis in terms of economic investments in it? Are we looking at it essentially as productivity and creativity and developing, as a prime minister said, our inherent capabilities as societies and communities to deal with our problems on our terms? And that's very important. So is our knowledge empowering or is our knowledge mimetic and captive? to other people's agendas and other people's uh, uh, knowledge systems. So can we break out of this dichotomy, firstly, of a high-end technology and a low-end technology, and the dichotomy between Indian ways of thinking and Western ways of thinking, and somehow in science, the Indian is inferior to the Western. In culture, somehow the Indian is somehow anterior and therefore superior to the Western. I think these are very, very uh, very imprisoning categories, and uh, we need to. Sandhi is a way of thinking beyond and transcending these limiting constructs to our knowledge. This is the first point I wanted to make on that, and this is what the new government's agenda is to engage with the interrogating what is it that constructs knowledge? Are these mimetic terms or borrowed terms? And why is there such a 
Why are we looking at uh, our own uh, history, our own uh, uh, indigenous capacities? But even the word indigenous is a wrong word. I have, frankly, objections to such a word. But I was just, I'm using that word only for the sake of lack of another word. So why are we, uh, why, why can we move beyond these, these, uh, these categories? I uh, want to give an example of that. So it's important to know the history of our knowledges. I mean, even in science, you construct your, your knowledge on the, on, the, on, the, on the shoulders of a long tradition of uh, research and work. You don't just drop, you know what I mean? So that's important to uh, see it in the experiential forms uh, that surround us. And when we use our technologies to understand that. I want to share one example with you on how relevant your seminar is today. Because uh, when I was collector in Dathia, uh, how many of you are familiar with that? Yeah, I think people who are working in the Bundelkhand region or water harvesting system would be familiar with the Bundela tanks here. Yeah, and I was collected there, and we suddenly had one fine night, it was a small drizzle of a rain. I was told from the, uh, uh, from the police station that, Madam, the city is inundating. That's unheard of because normally Bundelkhand is a water scarce region, and uh, it's, it's difficult to have inundation in the city. But suddenly he said, we don't know, but the whole city is flooding over and there's water getting in the doors and there's a riot on hands and people are coming out of their houses. So uh, I went to the police station to figure this out. And true enough, very soon people were coming out of the villages and moving towards by the city. So people from the, the whole, not just that their city, but the whole surrounding region was getting flooded. History had virtually flooded the, flooded modern that year. Why had that happened? Nobody knew what to do with that at all. One old man who was uh, just, a, just a person in the city, standing by watching our panic, said to me, do you know why you're flooding? You're flooding because all the Bundela tanks that, are, that surround the city of Dathya is like a saucer. They have been blocked by uh, Singhara Kheti or by roads. So unless you break, unless you do something about that, the water will not drain away. So nobody wanted to do that because nobody knew where to begin with. Then he said, this is a point, one particular talab, he said, this is a road, you need to break this road, and then the water will flow and drain away and your houses will be safe. We just went on intuition and did that, and then within an hour, the water had drained away. The city was normal. And the point I'm trying to make was, this is a perfect living example of where we build, or we build our civilization, we build our technologies. The same thing happened in Ujjain when I went as administrator. There we had very, very expensive very high tech. Sorry, I'm not against high tech. But we had we spent a lot of money because government gives grants. You come with a good proposal, you probably get a grant for it. We got high high tech stuff to run the to again manage what we're doing again, sanitation of the city because it's a heritage city. We couldn't do that because everybody had built shops on the traditional drainage systems. So they had an open stormwater drainage system, but somehow the whole architecture, the ecosystem of that architecture, and again the water Water as a principle for managing the city had been lost because our ways of using water, our ways of distributing water, and our ways of managing our own waterways had had a logic and a structure which was superimposed of the one that was historically given. I'm not arguing for the superiority of one over the other. I'm only saying it's very important to understand the historical logic of the evolution of these processes so that as lifestyles and as cultural habits change, we are aware and bring about the change in a more enlightened manner. This is, these are living examples and people's lives get impacted. So do we need technologies? Do we need scientific interventions in lives of people and communities without understanding their own knowledges and their own practices and their own aspirations? I don't think we need to be doing that. So Sadi is a way to join these different nodes of experience in a knowledge form, because you need very, very sound research to come to it. We can't suddenly break road because some old man says intuitively break the road here. I mean, that's ad hoc. That's not what we really want. But you need a sound body of knowledge and research. And Sandhi is an attempt, as it says, to join these different nodes and understandings of what makes for knowledge, and therefore what should be our uh, areas for research, and therefore for intervention. So this is a point I wanted to make here right now. The ministers, uh, the new minister, uh, Mrs. Uh, Srimati uh, Srimati Zubinirani, I uh, want to give you a small snatch of how she looks at Sandhi. <coughs> she, uh, uh, Professor Manna was again, will be witness to that, so much of what he, he and I have grown together in the last two months of the new government was being shared here. 
Uh, they, we were working on, there was, I had asked for the directors to come with a sort of a presentation of what was happening on a Sunday, mainly because I was then leaving. I had the last month at work and I wanted to consolidate this work from their report so that I could give it to the new government as a very important uh, effort. Uh, the new minister gave me two hours. She, I had just told her this, I was not giving an address like this. She's a very busy minister. In one sentence I had simply said, uh, Ma'am, the IITs are working on a very interesting exploration of culture and science together. They're looking at development, heritage, science, and culture in an integrated form. And that's making for very interesting pedagogies, very interesting research, and some very exciting things are happening. She said, good, can I give her a presentation? I said, no, I'm not qualified, but I've asked the people who work in it to give. Two hours she committed, this was she hardly one week old in the office. Two hours she said she will listen to the IT directors, her first interaction. That day, Mr. Munde died in the accident, Gopinath Munde. He's from Maharashtra, so obviously she was very close to him. And she canceled all her appointments, but she came and she spent, as Professor Munde, two hours in that meeting. She did not postpone that meeting. She spent two hours listening to all the presentations which were made then to her on Sunday. Partha Chakravarti made on the ID Karakpur Sunday. And he, he consolidated a lot of that, Professor Man. Also, two to three directors spoke about the work that they were trying to do. And she was amazed at the range. But the second thing I wanted to say, it's not just the, uh, it's not just, an, uh, it's not just how we look at things in an integrated manner, coming from, uh, let's say, uh, the way I do, like working with people. It's also how even the political perspectives on uh, learning are very integrated. Because they do not split it up. The grants may come split science and technology, immaturity, culture. But the perspectives are very integrated. And so she suddenly saw the link between all of this and saw huge potential for, uh, you know, for reaffirming, uh, the, uh, reaffirming the, the value of, uh, of our own knowledge systems. And in addition to that, to do that in a scientific, rational way. Not in, a, not in a blind, romanticizing way, but in a very rational way. And at the same time, she saw how science had become actually increasingly more meaningful to society. So because, so this is, uh, so she is, uh, was very happy to know that uh, I.D. Kanpur is taking the lead. I had spent a lot of time uh, messaging Dr. Manna and Komedi, I think, why is the website not working? Because she actually tweeted about the Sandhi initiative and she put, she put the website link there. The other point she wanted to make was why is the website, uh, this, you know, uh, IDK website, why can it not make or can it not be the stuff be written in a more uh, user friendly way? So she said, I'm using, I mean, in a way where even if you're not a technical expert, you can understand that thought process and that more people can get involved with it. That's the point she made. Even in the IT council, she said, can we do the, can we? Uh, present the research coming out or the issues coming out of the Sandhi process in a uh, parlance uh, with which the common man or the, common, the non, non uh, initiate can actually uh, cognize. And then that is how it will become part of everybody's knowledge systems. So that's a, something I like her to do. She's very keen on uh, institutionalizing these efforts because this has uh, come out of the scattered experience and interest of different people. And uh, one of the ways we want to do that is through the Santi Museum. And I'm glad to know that the seminar actually is an effort to put together a vernacular dialogue. I think the word vernacular is very good because unless we, we need, we, we can only speak best when we speak in a language which is our language. Because then we know somebody else's language equally. But we cannot begin with a borrowed language. And that's very true. So we need to get out of the colonizing influence of imported language. And vernac vernacular to me means that. So I'm very glad to know that the Sandy Museum will be using a vernacular idiom and uh, will help us to institutionalize in very innovative ways the interdisciplinary knowledge and research relevant to society and culture and enabled through a profound sense of science and technology to be housed, housed as a living experience. So I hope that the seminar is able to uh, come up with a sound blueprint for it, comedy, because uh, Professor Manna, I have to return. I've been allowed to come here on that condition, so I can go back with her, uh, with this blueprint for the, so Sandy moves to the next step of institutionalization with the museum, and we're also hoping maybe we set up some advanced studies and endologies also, so we need to look at that too. Huh? And again, uh, all these terms I'm using to 
deliberately challenge conventionally given and determined uh, connotations. I think that's uh, what I had to share with you here. Uh, I'll close with uh, uh, one, one recent interview I had with Professor B.B. Love just a few days back. He's 93 years old. And uh, he was being interviewed, I think, by the Sunday Initiative. And I was very impressed because he was actually explaining the flood harvesting system in this tank at Shingvirpur, very close from here. And uh, if that was the strength of our knowledge, then uh, is it right to uh, reject the history the, uh, of our entire knowledge system uh, just because uh, we think we have a different knowledge? It's important to look at all of that together. With one, it's a very good tool of sharpening our own senses and our own critical inquiry processes. Two, we just build better societies. We just build better knowledge systems. So uh, thank you very much here uh, for this opportunity of sharing with you. And uh, I hope that I have, uh, I hope that I will end by when I go back to with the uh, our blueprint and how we do the museum and how we move from just a Sunday thing, thing from Sunday like a project initiative, to a more formalized system of uh, Indological or Indic knowledge systems. That's a, that's a much wider canvas of thought. Thank you very much. I would like to invite uh, Professor Mana for uh, his words. Thank you, Pramati, and uh, very good morning to all of you. Uh, thanks to Ms. Sharma for coming for this particular meeting. And thanks to my colleagues who have come here and are taking active interest. Uh, just a couple of things. Number one, Adi Kanpur is uh, deeply committed towards this particular initiative and thankful to ministry for giving us a uh, certain sum of money and uh, setting aside a portion of that, nearly half of that, for uh, creating a so-called uh, museum. But we don't like the word museum. We'll have to coin a better word for it. Uh, essentially, we would like to showcase uh, uh, both the uh, high-end science, so-called high-end science, but also try to capture the initiatives of IIT Kanpur towards uh, combining uh, heritage and science, uh, which is Sandhi is all about. Uh, you know, Sandhi, there's a lot of misconception, but uh, I, I would like to uh, at least uh, offer some very easy explanation for all of us to appreciate. Uh, this is about two things. One is when you say heritage, you're trying to trace your root. So it's on one hand tracing your root. And tr when I say tracing your root, basically not towards something which is not relevant to us, pretty much relevant to us. I mean, starting from basic science, fundamental science to applied science or engineering, when you try to create and replicate all these activities, how it started in this part of the globe in our civilization, how it originated and how it uh, thrived and survived over the years and where we are today, how do we trace back to that. So to know your roots. And uh, the other part is to uh, prove our relevance to even the contemporary society. So which means uh, while we uh, try to solve the, the most complex equation or uh, come up with a theory which probably will combine certain multiple parameters and bring out new knowledge, while we certainly should pursue, and that continues to remain our main focus and aim, we also should make uh, ourselves relevant to the society around us. And that's what Mrs. Sharma was referring to as to the connotation the Prime Minister brought about in his brief address to us when we met him on the 22nd August at Rashtrapati Bhavan. Even the President also said similar things. And what it means is very simple. 45% of the country's uh, handicraft export uh, comes from this very state, Uttar Pradesh. And these artisans, uh, they uh, actually uh, produce uh, very important and beautiful uh, art objects, starting from glassware to brass metalware to wooden crafts and many other things. And uh, when Mrs. Sharma uh, was trying to uh, till this point in my head that why this is relevant, I was finding initially very difficult to understand. But then I immediately could find a very simple thing which is uh, uh, quite relevant to my uh, uh, basic discipline of metallurgy. And I 
explain something to her and she was very impressed. So that's how we could get some money from the MHRD. But uh, what uh, actually I found very gratifying in between is that you know, we have been doing these things uh, all along, not that we just got started. Uh, there, there are a few initiatives in the Institute which are going on. And recently I came across uh, a, an example where uh, we are all aware of the, the horse shoe. The, the hoof of the horse is pretty soft and then you have to protect that uh, uh, with, with an iron nail. Uh, and this particular uh, horse shoe generally would last about seven days. And uh, some of my colleagues here in material science engineering, particularly Professor uh, uh, R uh, Radhi, uh, Sandeep Sangal and uh, uh, I think uh, Kalon Mandal and some of their students. And I was also very uh, pleasantly surprised I found one of the students who is in my class. He's also a part of that project. What they've done is they basically after they use a reinforcing steel uh, rod, which is used in all constructions. These are called torsed steels because they're given a torsional uh, deformation so that the residual compressive stress on the surface, residual stress on the surface is compressive in nature. So these are thrown out like, uh, so these uh, uh, iron smiths, they pick up those from the garbage and then they cut out and uh, make those uh, heat it up and then bend and then make it exactly conform to the shape of the hoof and that's how the, uh, these nails are made, these horseshoes are made in this part of the country. And they actually were demonstrating how they do it and uh, Sandeep Sangal simply told them uh, not to leave it in the open but after the uh, craft is done, the fabrication is over, uh, dip it in a bucket full of uh, uh, graphite powder. All of you are aware that graphite is a high conducting material and uh, uh, the rate of heat extraction for metallurgies it's very simple thing which we teach always in the classes that in iron carbon system the cooling rate determines the final microstructure and hence the mechanical properties of the material. So just simply by applying that uh, intervention now that same horseshoe lasts uh, instead of one week lasts three weeks. And uh, the, uh, the, the fellow, the, the owner of the horse actually was there and he said, Ki, now I have a problem because it doesn't wear out. So I mean, normally they're used to removing it uh, within uh, seven days or something. So, so the point is that uh, a simple intervention, uh, for example, something else, if you show them to treat in a certain way, and if that adds life or value and increases the cost or the, the, the uh, valuation of the product by say 10 or 15 percent. So that together for all kinds of products cutting across from uh, glass repeats to glass fairs or ceramic products or metal objects or wooden crafts and everything if you can show the color if the color lasts say a few months more if the color is brighter, if you can show them how to dispose of the poisonous or so-called hazardous materials so that the artisans, craftsmen, their health is protected, how to uh, treat or recycle some of these materials and restore. If you go to Farukabad or one of these uh, uh, remote places in Uttar Pradesh, you'll find a, a, a family treasures a lump of glass as the most precious um, object or most precious treasure for the whole family because that particular lump of glass contains very small amount of PB level of certain trace additions uh, in the form of maybe cobalt or maybe arsenic or something which gives a particular color which you cannot bring in uh, without having very homogeneous distribution of those elements throughout. So there is a a good amount of science involved in it that how could 100 years ago somebody, uh, maybe grandfather or great grandfather, could actually achieve uniform distribution of cobalt in that glass matrix of silicate throughout the matrix I and mean, how, how could diffusion occur so uniformly that the distribution is so. So there's a lot of spectroscopic work, a lot of 
things could be done about it. And I know some of my colleagues are actually interested to look at it from the applied mechanics point of view, from the elemental distribution point of view, from physical laws which actually govern the planetary motion or uh, even from planetary motion all the way to the description of an atom or atomic aggregate. So there is deep root of, there, there is deep science involved in that. So the entire Sandhi initiative is like, uh, again, as I said, two things uh, put together, but essentially two sides of the same coin, that you're tracing, trying to trace you to your roots, and on the other hand, you are trying to prove relevance to the society around you. So Adi Kanpur will uh, certainly uh, continue to uh, pay very deep attention to this, and we hope to come out with some good knowledge. But the, the most, uh, in my opinion, useful part would be that if we can prove ourselves relevant to these artis artisans, train them and uh, show them some way so that they can earn maybe 10, 20 percent more than what they're earning and also save their health and their practices. And this is what the country expects from us. But this is without compromising with our main intention, main focus for which IITs were created, pursue knowledge of the highest order. Thank you very much. This uh, beautifully puts into perspective what Sandhi means and what we would attempt to do today with uh, the symposium.